Thank you so much for being here. My name is Dion Rossiter and I am the executive director of a program called Science at Cal, which you will learn a little bit more about in just one minute. I first want to welcome you to our this November installment of Midday Science Cafe. We have an exciting program for you today, expanding the frontiers of biofuels, algae's rise and as an alternative energy source. We have Dr. Melissa Roth, a research biology, biologist in the Department of Plant and Microbial Biology at UC Berkeley, and Dr. Sarah Calhoun, a postdoctoral fellow at the Joint Genome Institute. As you know, if you've been joining us throughout the last six months, Midday Science Cafe is a collaboration between UC Berkeley and the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. So we are excited to have you here. I wanna start with a land acknowledgement. Uh, we recognize that Berkeley sits on the Huchun territory, the ancestral and unceded land of the Ohlone people, the successors of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone tribe and other familial descendants of the Verona band. Every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. Consistent with our values of community and diversity, we have the responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to the native peoples. By offering this land acknowledgement, the Berkeley community not only recognizes the history of the land on which we stand, but also recognizes that the Ohlone people are alive and flourishing members of the Berkeley and broader Bay Area communities today. So thank you for allowing me to take the time to say those words. Again, I am the executive director of Science at Cal. We celebrate science through public programming. Typically we run science cafes, lectures, festivals, and more within our communities across Berkeley and across the Bay Area. But we have pivoted like most programs and now we are providing online content for you. We are so excited to be here. We have, uh, we'll be starting off a brand new set of three other lectures as we enter the new year. So stay tuned for those. Please join our listserv. You can find us at science at cal at berkeley.berkeley.edu. Our email address, our Facebook, our Twitter, our Instagram is all at science at cal. Before I hand it over to Lawrence Berkeley Labs, I just want to give you a little, a few notes that we will run through both uh, Melissa's and Sarah's presentations today. And in between, we will have a short time for Q&A for each of our speakers before we bring everyone together and go through some question and answer period together. So what that means is I want you all to be active writing in your questions in the chat, the Q&A box, um, if you can throughout the presentations and we'll get to each one of your questions as we ask our panelists uh, at the end, either at the end or in between their talks, uh, we'll go, we'll have a chance to get your questions answered. Um, we will be recording, we are recording this session, I should say, and uh, we will uh, post this online afterwards. So if you'd like to share with your friends and family and colleagues, please do so. Uh, so be, that is all I have to say before I'm now handing things over to Jen Tang at Berkeley Lab. Hello, Jen. Hi, Dee. Thanks so much. Uh, hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Jen Tang, and I'm the Director for Federal and Community Relations at Berkeley Lab. For those of you who don't know, Berkeley Lab is one of 17 US Department of Energy national laboratories that are spaced throughout the country uh, that are tackling the critical scientific challenges of our time. Berkeley Lab is supported by DOE through its Office of Science and we're managed by the University of California. Since our founding nearly 90 years ago in 1931 by a UC Berkeley physics professor named Ernest Orlando Lawrence, Berkeley Lab has been dedicated to advancing the scope of human knowledge and seeking science solutions to some of the greatest problems facing humankind. Today, Berkeley Lab researchers develop sustainable energy and environmental solutions. We create useful new materials. We advance the frontiers of computing and we probe the mysteries of life matter and the universe. All of the research we conduct at the lab is unclassified. 
Our main campus, as you might know, is nestled in the Berkeley Hills, northeast of UC Berkeley, and we employ about 4,000 people, about 1,700 of whom are scientists, engineers, and faculty members. We have more than 500 employees uh, who are undergraduate and graduate students. These are scientists that are just beginning their research journey. Uh, Berkeley Labs proximity to Cal and our close ties to the UC system create a pretty unique and synergistic environment for the science for scientific discovery. Uh, we have a number of lab researchers who have affiliations with one of the UC campuses, either as students, postdocs, or professors with joint appointments at the lab. As you can imagine, Berkeley Labs' relationship with UC Berkeley is especially close, and our institutions have joined forces to advance science across a number of frontiers. One of the main motivations for creating our Midday Science Cafe series is to share with you some examples of compelling and complementary scientific research from both of our institutions. Now, this November series, uh, this November uh, event is going to be our last Midday Science Cafe lecture for 2020. Uh, so we hope you enjoyed today's presentation, uh, and we look forward to highlighting other science stories for you in 2021. If you've got topics that you're interested in hearing about, feel free to put them in the Q&A, and we'll take note of those for our program next year. With that, Dee, let me turn it back to you. Thank you, thank you, Jen. And with that, I am going to stop share and I'm going to invite Melissa up. She will be our first speaker. So Melissa Roth, go ahead and take over the screen. Um, I'll just do a quick, quick intro. So Melissa is an interdisciplinary physiologist and ecologist studying photosynthetic organisms, symbiosis and global change. She is interested in how the environment shapes life in life that shapes the environment. Her research seeks to understand how dynamic abiotic factors such as light, temperature, and nutrients affect organisms and their biology. Melissa leads a small group at UC Berkeley that focuses on how algae sense, respond, and adapt to changing uh, environment with application towards using algae for sustainable development of byproducts and biofuels. Her group uses a variety of approaches from molecular biology to laboratory experiments to field studies to investigate e ecological factors and provide solutions to mitigate environmental problems. That was a mouthful, so she'll tell you more about what all that means. Um, Melissa is a two-time U.S. National Academy of Sciences Cavley Frontiers of Science Fellow. Congratulations, Melissa. She loves being immersed in nature, adventuring with her family, and experiencing the world through the eyes of her kids. So, Melissa, can't wait to hear more from you. We can see your screen perfectly, so go ahead, take it away. Okay, great. Thanks, Dee. Uh Thank you for the introduction and the opportunity uh, to talk to you all today. I'm excited um, to tell you, give you this present presentation. Uh, the title of my talk is called Algae, Unsung Heroes of Our Past, Present, and Future. And I'm excited to tell you about what I think are probably one of the most underrated and overlooked life forms, and that is algae, and how they've been absolutely critical to evolution of life on earth, our everyday survival, and potentially our future as well. So let's begin with a nice, deep, relaxing breath. So that's not only calming, but the oxygen we breathe is required by our bodies and fuels our cells. Let's take another breath. And the oxygen, one from those two breaths, comes from algae. And when you hear of algae, you might think of little green cells, little brown cells. You may even think of ponds or algae floating on the surface of pond. Here's some green algal pond scum. You might even think of kelp forests where brown algae stretch from the seafloor to the ocean surface uh, to make a forest for many animals. Or you might think of coral reefs where tiny algal cells live inside corals that not only give corals their color, but also the energy to build coral reef ecosystems. Algae are found not only in lakes and oceans, but also um, in soil, snow, ice, um, hot springs, inside animals, and even on the fur of animals like polar bears. They can be tiny like microscopic plankton, 
or they can be very large like kelp, which can stretch almost half the height of our coastal redwoods. They can be unicellular or multicellular. They can live alone or in colonies. They are a broad and diverse group and are often grouped with plants. But generally algae are defined as oxygenic photosynthetic organisms um, that have the light absorbing pigment chlorophyll A. And just a note on nomenclature, algae is a plural world, word and alga is the singular. So here's a look at global primary production. This is a composite image of earth showing the magnitude and distribution of primary producers. And you can see the areas of highest productivity in dark red in the oceans and blue green on land. And billions of years ago, algae were critical for the buildup of oxygen in our atmosphere that set the stage for most of evolution of life on Earth. And currently algae account for about 50% of primary production. So algae are an important for biogeochemical cycling. Um, they, in particular, they convert inorganic carbon to organic carbon. So they're important to the carbon cycle, which of course we know has a huge impact on weather, climate and global change. Algae has many important ecological roles, such as at the base of aquatic food webs. And recently, interest in algae has grown because of their ability to be produced sustainably. And many products can be produced from algae, such as for fertilizers, pharmaceuticals, food, feed, and bioenergy. And algae are at the base of the plant lineage. So it's important to understand conserved mechanisms which means that discoveries in algae can have implications in improving crops or agriculture. So at the heart of algae is its photosynthesis, and that's the conversion of light energy into chemical energy. And we know a lot about the fundamentals of photosynthesis, this complex series of reactions that uses sunlight um, to convert carbon dioxide and water into carbohydrates that we eat and oxygen that we breathe. But what we still don't know a lot about is the photosynthesis assembly, regulation, and dynamics. And that's what the focus of my research is. Algae also produce many different proteins, pigments, oils, um, which we call lipids, and many other bioproducts. And these are of interest not only for their commercial uh, sustainability and production, but also because of the property of the products. And I'll discuss one such product. So, my group uh, uses algae that have very flexible metabolism, which means that under specific conditions, some algae can actually change from being autotrophic, which means they use light to make organic carbon, uh, to heterotrophic, which means they take up or eat organic carbon, like animals, like us. So this also completely changes and redirects metabolisms and the products they make. So one alga my group has studied extensively is the unicellular green alga called Chromochlorus Sophingensis. And this is what it looks like. This is a culture in the lab. Um, and, and this is a picture on, from under the microscope. There are these fairly nondescript uh, cells. But what's really exciting about this organism is when we change its environment, what it's grown in, we can see a dramatic change in the culture. And so these experiments are a lot of fun because they're so visual and it happens pretty quickly and so much is happening in the cell. So let's dive into this a bit more. So I'll show you a fun time lapse that my graduate student Daniel Westcott has made. So on the green culture on the left, cells are grown normally autotrophically. And then we add this carbon supplement, in this case, glucose to the culture. And glucose is a favorite energy source for many organisms. And you can see as I start this time lapse that the green goes away and it turns to pink. And the culture on the right that was pink uh, was, was grown with glucose and that was removed and then it turned to green. So you can see that was pretty fast. Um, so let's watch that again. So here we have the cultures and as we start losing uh, the green color, photosynthesis is actually shut off. The cells stop evolving oxygen and they actually reduce their photosynthetic complexes. And this process is reversible in a short period of time, photosynthesis can come back on in hours. And this pink color is due to a carotenoid called astaxanthin, and it accumulates in high abundances. And I'll tell you more about that in just a moment. 
But first I wanna give you an inside look into the cells specifically. So this is um, the autotrophic cell on the left and the heterotrophic on the right. And these are serial x-rays taking through the cell um, and then similar to a CT scan. And then we segment and reconstruct and so we can get a whole picture of the cell. And this technique is called soft x-ray tomography. Um, and this was done at the Berkeley lab with the Larabelle group. And you can see now that we've reconstructed the chloroplast in green, star granules inside the chloroplast are in blue. We've got the nucleus showing up now in purple. In red, we've got the mitochondria, which are the respiratory organelles of the cell. And last, we have the lipids, which are in yellow or the oil droplets. And you can see over here in the glucose culture, we have this huge wall of lipids that showed up right next to the periphery of the cell. And this, all these lipid droplets or oil droplets right there are the accumulation of the preferred biofuel precursor called triacylglycerol or TAG, as well as astaxanthin. So in that um, oil droplet, we have both this, um, this product astaxanthin as well as this preferred biofuel precursor. So that's really interesting. So let's learn a little bit more about astaxanthin. Astaxanthin is a carotenoid pigment like beta carotene from carrots. Um, and except that astaxanthin is pink. So it's the reason why salmon and flamingos uh, look pink. They acquire astaxanthin through their diet. And so we've had a long history of use of astaxanthin in industry, um, primarily as a coloring agent and often in aquaculture. It's the reason why farmed salmon uh, look pink. But more recently, it's been shown natural astaxanthin produced by a microalgae. Um, is a high value product. And that's because it's of interest for a nutraceutical. Here's a product made from algal um, astaxanthin that people take as a nutraceutical to help in human uh, immunity health and eye health. And more recently, the pharmaceutical industry has found that it is broadly beneficial for many diseases like cancer, cardiovascular and neurodegenerative diseases. So it's become a lot of interest in this product. And because this organism pairs this biofuel precursor with this high value product, it potentially makes uh, this alga very attractive for bioenergy. So in my group, we really wanna know more about the regulation of these processes. So what we do is we first wanted to sequence its genome and transcriptome. And a genome is like the biological blueprint of the organism. And then the transcriptome can tell us the changes in gene expression, which tells us how the cell is being reprogrammed. And what I'm showing you here is a uh, barcoded map of the genome. You can see that we did that has 19 chromosomes here. And that allows us then to look at the gene expression, which is the changes in gene copies uh, with our experiments. So here is, uh, it's actually a fairly complex figure, but the take home message is quite simple. So the yellow are genes that have increased in number of copies or the gene expression goes up as we say, and blue has gone down. And the black arrow represents that when we added the glucose and the white arrow when we take it away. So you can see as you move through a gene horizontally that cells that uh, genes that went increased in expression with glucose then decreased when we removed it. So we had this real reversible process of gene regulation. And the same with genes that went down, then they came back up in the opposite process. So having this environmentally controlled switch really allows us to find um, exciting genes of interest that are responsible for these switches. And another way we can try to find uh, players that are involved in these switches is to use a, use a really classical uh, approach of, called forward genetics. So here I did an experiment where I took the algal cells and I exposed them to UV radiation and that makes random mutations in the organism. And then I test for the phenotype I'm looking for. So here's wild type WT. And you can see we get the normal uh, green without glucose, and then we get the astaxanthin pink with glucose. And you can see these two strains, they no longer change. They no longer shut off photosynthesis and they no longer accumulate astaxanthin. And we got a handful of these uh, algae uh, strains. And so we then sequence the whole genome and then we find where they have a shared mutation. And the gene they all had a shared mutation in was called hexokinase. Um, which is abbreviated HXK. And hexokinase is an important, um, is an important uh, metabolic enzyme. It's the first step of glycolysis. 
And this research shows that hexokinase is important for the molecular switch of photosynthesis and um, metabolism in green algae. And so in summary, I just want to, sh uh, sh I'm happy that I got to share with you that we've developed this dynamic system of this simple alga that can turn into an animal and then back again. And that provides a really exciting look into many processes. And sugars play really fundamental roles in physiology, metabolism, growth in plants and animals, including humans. Um, and so here we have a really simple system uh, to investigate really basic um, conserved mechanisms of sugar sensing and signaling. And we're working on trying to understand this regulation so that we can find uh, novel players in different genes that can give us options to exploit um, for bioproducts such as bioenergy or to improve agriculture and crop production. And I just want to end quickly that science is a real uh, team effort. This is our group here, main group of collaborators that we call Team Switch. Um, and I just want to acknowledge my main uh, mentor, Chris Niyogi, uh, for enabling me to build our group, my group, and our students, Daniel Westcott, Tim Jeffers, Shivani Abdaya, um, who helped significantly with this work. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you so much. Yes, please remember, add your Q and your questions to the Q&A box. So, Melissa, this is all things that are happening in the lab, correct? I'm curious, what's the scale up plan for what you're doing here? What's the end goal? Sure. So our research, which actually uh, I forgot to mention, was funded by the U.S. Department of Energy, um, the U.S. Uh, Department of Agriculture, as well as the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And we are really on the basic research side that allows us to find these novel players um, and genes that can be involved. And so the next steps of the real applied are sort of much more downstream from where our lab really fits in. We really stay on the basic research side, um, but then there would be other um, groups and agencies that would then be responsible for field trials or those kinds of things. But for us, we're on the real basic biology side and trying to find what are these avenues that are worth uh, pursuing. Great. I'm glad I said that. So you could, you could thank all the funders out there. <laughs> it's, important, it's important to mention who, who pays the bills, right? <laughs> My next question is, um, so you mentioned all of the, like how algae is so beneficial through, through the carbon cycle. Is there a way that folks at home can actually use algae? Is there technology or budding technology, or even a way to harness kind of the, the carbon that lies within these systems? Like, can you go to a pond and harness it in some way? So there are companies that uh, sell to have sort of algal, uh, like, aquarium type to uh -huh. have um, in the home, which uh, some algae produce bioluminescence. And so that's a lot of fun. You can shake it up and then it glows. Um, but in terms of sort of helping with biogeochemical cycling, that's over really long processes. And um, there, I guess, if you wanted to have a role in trying to help improve, I think the best thing to do would be to be going out and planting trees mm -hmm. and things like mm -hmm. that. What you really want um, in terms of if you wanted to have an impact on climate change is to getting the carbon stored into really long-term um, places. Right, okay. So more longer life cycle carbon movement. Yeah, you want it to get, mm -hmm. you want it to come out of the atmosphere and to get sequestered ideally, you know, after Hun, you yeah. know, hundreds of years, then that would get into the sediments and into the soil and down, right? And that's the problem with fossil fuels is that we are burning, you know, photosynthetic products and organisms from millions of years ago. And so we're releasing all of that very quickly. And so it's a really long time scale. Um, algae are on a much shorter time scale, um, but there's, there's potential like in the ocean for trying to do say deep sea um, sequestration or things like that. Okay, we'll leave harnessing uh, algae as a biofuel to the experts. Um, and we'll plant trees. Um, so <laughs> thank you. I'm gonna, with that, we'll hand it over to our next expert and I will introduce Jen back to the floor to help us introduce Sarah.
So thank you, Melissa. Thanks so much. And it is now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Sarah Calhoun. And Sarah, I'll ask you to join us on the screen. Uh, so Sarah is a postdoctoral bioinformatics researcher in the fungal and algal genomics group at the Joint Genome Institute, or JGI, where she researches algae for the potential as biofield production strains. At the JGI, she collaborates on large scale product projects with researchers close to home and across the world to sequence the genomes of novel algal strains. With computational tools, she analyzes diverse data sets from genomics, metabolomics, and transcriptomics to understand regulation and metabolism in algae. And yes, that is a lot of omics. Prior to joining JGI, Sarah received a Bachelor's of Science in Bioengineering from the University of Washington and a PhD in Biophysics from UC San Francisco. For her PhD studies, she developed a method to predict the function of unknown genes and microbes. When she's not at work, Sarah enjoys attending ballet classes, hiking, and playing with her cat. And with that, Sarah, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Jen, and hi to everyone out there. Um, as Jen mentioned, I'm a postdoc at the Joint Genome Institute, or JGI, and we're at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. So the Joint Genome Institute is considered a user facility, part of the Department of Energy. And that means we facilitate the research driven by the scientific community to advance DOE mission areas. So I'll just start by sharing why the DOE is interested in studying algae and why you should also be interested. So algae play a significant role in the environment and energy applications. As Melissa had already mentioned, they perform nearly half of the planet's photosynthesis. It's important for carbon cycling, removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and then producing oxygen. Uh, similar to what Melissa showed, here's just a map showing the abundance of the photosynthetic uh, pigment chlorophyll that's found in algae. And it's just showing how prevalent they are across the oceans, particularly along the coasts. Uh, algae also play an important ecological role. One example is that they form toxic algal blooms. And this can cause problems like poisoning the drinking water and also harming marine wildlife. We also study algae due to their complex evolutionary history. This tree shows the evolutionary relationships among different groups of algae. And by studying different organisms, we can learn more about their history, like the origin of photosynthesis. And lastly, they have potential in bioenergy and many different biotech, biotech applications, ranging from different industries like cosmetics, pharmaceuticals, or the food industry. And through our community science program, we work with academic researchers, national lab partners, and industry partners across the world on projects that relate to all of these questions. And today we're talking about the potential of algae as biofuel feedstocks. So algae have great potential as biofuel feedstocks. First, they can perform photosynthesis. Uh, they fix carbon from carbon dioxide and convert light energy into chemical energy. This means that they're self-sustaining and nearly carbon neutral. Second, some algae can accumulate oily droplets, which are made up of a class of molecules we call lipids. These lipids could be extracted and then converted to biofuels. And I'll come back to these lipids later. And third, in contrast to plants, algae require minimal land use. Typically, they can be cultivated in water, and so less land area is needed. Here I'm showing a map of the United States showing how much area of corn would be needed to be grown to replace all of the gasoline consumed in the United States. So this is nearly a third of the land area of our country and compare that to the area of corn currently in cultivation. So this is much too large of a, a demand on our resources. In contrast, you see the area of land needed to grow algae to replace all of the gasoline consumed and you can see it's a much more efficient use of land. The main drawback of algal biofuels is that there's challenges in scaling up. This leads to a high cost of production. Currently, the cost is estimated roughly to be about $10 a gallon for algal biofuels, and this is too high to be competitive on the market with conventional fossil fuels. 
the DOE has set a target cost of $3 a gallon of algal biofuels. We're trying to reach this by 2030. So how do we get to lower costs of algal biofuels? One approach is to find the best strains of algae to use as a biofuel feedstock. It's estimated that there are over 100,000 different strains of algae. And a national consortium of scientists are testing for which algae grow the best. We can look for traits like high oil production and large biomass accumulation. This is a picture showing one of the test beds in Mesa, Arizona. It's a public-private partnership which screens for which algae are growing the best. And they grow them in these outdoor raceway ponds you see here. An alternative is these photobioreactors. So this is growing in a lab-controlled setting indoors, but it allows us to simulate outdoor conditions. You can control conditions like temperature, light, or pH, or salinity. And this allows us to test a, a wider range of conditions than you would be able to do outdoors. So once we find the most promising candidates, we want to learn more about them and their biology. Our main goal is to identify genes that play a role in regulating biofuel production and growth. And this is where sequencing the genome is key. We can begin to investigate the DNA and genes that encode the traits that give them better properties whether it's higher photosynthetic ability, faster growth rate, or more tolerant to changing conditions. Here I'm showing a picture of one of the sequencing instruments that we have at JGI. And the eventual output is this unique sequence of nucleotides that make up the DNA of our organism. These A, T, Cs, or Gs are abbreviations for the four different nucleotides. And we publish and share these genomes with the public. And this is critically important. The scientific community uses the genome to build off of their own research. So one of the top producing strains was a strain of algae that originated actually from a brewery in Colorado. So this was a, the new Belgium brewery, so in Fort Collins. Um, if you've seen Fat Tire or other new Belgium beer in the grocery aisle, our alga comes from the same place. Our collaborators isolated the strain and then extracted the DNA. We sequenced the genome at the JGI and then identified that it was this new species of algae. And then with the genome, we can begin to characterize the molecular traits to provide a foundation for genetic engineering and ultimately improve these for more of their applications in biofuels. So I mentioned once we have a genome, we can start characterizing it. We can perform a range of experiments. And one of the experiments we were interested in is how do algae adapt to lower temperatures? And this is relevant because when we're growing them outdoors in these farms, there's these temperature changes that they must be able to adjust to. And if you think about it, when you or I go outside and it gets cold, we can adapt to the temperature change by putting on a sweater or putting on more layers. But algae also respond to the temperature change, but they don't have little sweaters to put on. So instead, they change their cellular composition. So we perform an experiment to understand this mechanism by growing algae in different temperatures. We grow them in the average summer temperature and also a, a lower, colder temperature. And these temperatures were chosen to mimic the conditions of the outdoor test beds in Arizona. In addition to genome sequencing, JGI also performs other types of measurements. We can look at expression levels across all the genes in the genome. This is called the transcriptome. And this tells us which genes are turned on or turned off in response to the cold temperature. Melissa showed a similar type of experiment on chromochloris. We also perform metabolomics, which shows us which metabolites are being produced. One example is this lipid molecule, which is a useful precursor for oil products. And we see that certain classes of lipid molecules increase in the cold temperature. So with these observations, we can predict which genes will improve traits like cold tolerance or lipid production. And this demonstrates the power of using genome sequencing in conjunction with other techniques to facilitate improvement of algae for these applications. 
Progress in algal biofuels has been enabled by new sequencing technologies. We've now at the JGI established a pipeline for sequencing and characterizing new algal strains. And the algal research community as a whole is sequencing more and more. The plot shown here shows the number of published algal genomes on the y-axis. And on the x-axis is the year that it was published with different colored lines showing different groups of algae. But focusing in on this gray line, which is the overall number, you can see as we're approaching uh, the end of the chart, it's getting close to 100 algal genomes. And if you were to extend this to today in 2020, we've surpassed 100 algal genomes. And that's Im so impressive if you compare that to 10 years ago when we had 10 times fewer. And not only is the number of sequenced genomes of algae growing, but the sequencing technology and genomic tools are continuing to improve. Our understanding of algal biology is better and our ability to engineer the algae is also better. So looking to the future, as we as a society are looking for more options to mitigate the effects of climate change, algal biofuels have the potential to contribute to lowering greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and offer a new alternative source of energy. So pursuing these options is a worthwhile investment. Finally, I'll just end by saying I also work with a team of collaborators. I'm just going to highlight a few right now is our group leader, Igor Grigoriev, as well as our close collaborators at Los Alamos National Lab and uh, the National Renewable Energy Lab, as well as the Pacific Northwest National Lab. And then I also want to encourage you to follow us for updates on science projects on not just algae, but also JGI does a lot of work on microbes, viruses, plants, and fungi. And you can uh, learn about all these new um, uh, advances by following us on various social media platforms. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sarah. That was a really great presentation. Uh, I've got a couple questions that I want to ask you before we bring uh, Dee and Melissa back. So the first question is, you know, there are a lot of crops being considered for biofuels like corn, soybeans, and switchgrass. Um, can you talk a little bit about the pros and cons of different types of feedstocks for biofuels? Yeah, and I do want to mention that um, at JGI, we're exploring all these options as well. There are people who are investigating uh, plants as feedstock, as biofuel feedstocks, as well as fungi. And so, um, they all have their pros and cons and we wanna explore all our options. In terms of trying to tease apart some of the pros and cons, some of the ones that come to mind most obviously is that algae do offer a benefit in terms of high efficiency, high growth, and they also require less land. Um, one of the drawbacks perhaps in using algae is they do require a lot of water to be grown in and other sort of nutrients that may sustain the culture as well as algae just not being as well characterized as some of the plants that are being used as fuel feedstocks. Got it, thank you. Um, and another question that we have here is, what do you think the biggest barrier is in moving algal biofuels from the lab to the marketplace uh, where we can see it be more fully and broadly deployed? And can you talk a little bit about how the Department of Energy is supporting fundamental and applied research in this space? Yeah. So. Uh, the Department of Energy is definitely supportive in this area in terms of moving this to something that we can actually see in the real world. Uh, probably the biggest challenge is the unpredictable nature of moving something from a small lab scale to a large commercial scale. Um, when you grow things in larger scale, in fact, for algae, sometimes they kind of inhibit each other in terms of blocking out light or when they're crowding, you can uh, cause decreased growth. So all of these challenges of moving from small to big is extremely unpredictable when you're working on uh, new organisms like algae. And then as far as how the DOE is investing, um, this is just one aspect of their investment as we're uh, kind of more of a genome focused biology institute. And so all of our um, solutions are more focused on the scale of the genetics and the genome, but there's definitely numerous engineering challenges that the Department of Energy is also investing in. 
how do we lower the overall cost of harvesting and refining and other process, uh, processes um, that get us from you know, algae to actual oil at our ga gas pump? Great. Thanks so much, Sarah, for those thoughtful answers. Um, let me actually ask you now to stop sharing your screen sure. and we'll bring Dee and Melissa back uh, to rejoin us and kick off our official Q&A session. Yeah, thanks everyone. I want to remind you to add your questions to the Q&A box, but both amazing presentations. Thank you so much. Um, Melissa, I see you are surrounded by algae back there. <laughs> Yeah, and Sarah, the big one. Go ahead. Species. I've got <laughs> this is Chromochlorosophagensis. It's always with me. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Okay. So I know you both talked about turning genes on and off. And we have a question from the audience that what criteria will determine the best algae for fuel? So what do you guys think? Maybe you both can answer this because you're both studying how uh, the different properties of algae and what would, what would you consider the best properties? Do you want I'll start. Um, yeah. One thing in terms of the best properties, mm -hmm. what is actually going to grow the best when we move it to large scale? And when I mean grow the best, I mean um, accumulate a lot of mass, but also a lot of the oil. And it's really just how do you get large amounts? Because the biggest challenge is how do you get cost down? And to get mm -hmm. cost down, you just have to grow in scale. Mm -hmm. But it's really not just one property you can optimize. And I mean, growing best is one thing, but can it survive throughout the year? Are you going to have to rotate it when the winter comes? Uh, so I think that there's a lot of factors and unknowns we still need to know when we're looking at um, the best alga. Right, so I'll just add on to that, right? So there are a lot of factors Sarah's kind of mentioning with production, right? And if you could use wastewater, right? Instead of fresh water mm. or salt water, if you have less likely of contamination, right? All these different factors. And then I'd say where our research is really looking at is if you can remember in the, in the uh, picture of the cell, when we grew it with glucose, right? We had that whole wall of oil droplets that really showed up. And those are actually... The, uh, the preferred biofilm precursors, triacylglycerols are in there. And so we're not, of course, saying, oh, let's grow them all like that. What we're trying to figure out is what genes are responsible and can we make that algae sort of always in that state, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's always producing more of that, um, that preferred product. And so that's kind of where our research lies is trying to find what are these you know, things that we can tweak to then exploit and then really up our ability to, to get more biofuels for less cost. Because right now it's just a it's just a numbers game with the production costs. And we're algae have a huge, um, we're really far behind from like the plant side where we have all the uh, tractors and ways to harvest large amounts of crops. We don't have that developed for algae yet, right? We don't really have all the, you know, tractors have been around for, I don't know, hundred years, I don't know, really long time. Um, but we don't have ways to sort of really mass collect the algae and refine it to get the product that we need. And so that's, that's where we're really um, working are in those production costs. Mm -hmm. So you've, the industry or the field has uh, mapped over a hundred genomes, you said, right, Sarah? Yes. Yeah. How many are there? Oh, how many <laughs> algae? Yeah. So yeah, there, <laughs> There's estimates in terms of how many different algae there are. Um, we really don't know exactly the number. Um, taxonomists are estimating that there's over 100,000 different strains. Um, so in terms of sequencing all of those, um, probably not likely, but maybe the ones that are most relevant. And in terms of sequencing, which, choosing which to sequence, one thing we like to do is because there's so many, we want to get a diversity of algae sequenced and that will cover more space so we can learn more about them. Um, but sure, any strains that are of high interest uh, like the Chromochloris or the Senodesmus that I'm working on, um, uh, ones that have a practical application, we also definitely want to sequence those. 
And the idea is, is because they're, you're sequencing a diversity and they're so different that once you start understanding what is turning on and off, you can then harness all of these different genes within the full hundred that you have sequenced. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So you can start to learn about um, a particular group and then sort of extrapolate to related ones. Great. And Jen I'll just add on that, D. Mm -hmm. So once you have a whole collection of mm -hmm. algae, and if you have ones that are um, oil accumulators and ones that are not, you can do comparative genomics and look at, you know, what are all the genes that all the ones that do accumulate oil have in common. And so you can do these kind of, we call them cuts, like um, the most classic example for us is the green cut, which is when we wanted to know what are all the genes that are involved in photosynthesis. So um, this is work done by Sabia Merchants Group that they published in 2007 with the first algal genome published, Chlamydomonas reinhardii, which is the green algal model algal system. And so they did a comparison, right, where you take green algae and plants, anything that does, does photosynthesis and anything that doesn't, and then you can find what genes are required for photosynthesis. Because one of the challenges with genomes is really like that there are, there are thousands of genes um, for example, in Chromochloris, we have about 14,000 genes, and actually only a small fraction of the number of genes do we actually know their function, right? So there's a large number of unknown genes and unknown diversity in there that could be really important, but we just don't even know. And even the genes that we think we do know, a lot of those are just sort of transferred over from what we know in another system, right? We don't actually know for the actual organism we're studying. It could have had a little tweak to the, to the gene, to the DNA, um, which could have a huge change in function, but we just kind of assume because it's similar to that one and we know. But the actual number of genes that we like have actually tested the function is minuscule, right? And so, but the genomes have a lot of information, right? They have all the information on what all the biological diversity, all the phys physiological diversity. And so that's why they're so powerful because um, they really have that whole uh, toolkit of what's available. Very helpful. Thank you, Melissa. That was, that was a lot of information. <laughs> thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> Uh, so we've got a couple questions coming in from the audience. Um, so someone observed that uh, gas in some states across the United States, it's pretty cheap right now in Texas and Tennessee, it's $2 a gallon. Um, Sarah, I think you mentioned that, you know, DOE has a goal to drive down the cost to about $3 by 2030. Um, are there any ways for this process to be accelerated to get to uh, sort of where we are right now with other fuels? Yeah, to, in terms of low, getting that cost lower, maybe um, to be more competitive with what we're paying for at the gas pump. Yeah, um, I think that the biggest target is just to get better scale up. Um, but I think that one way of lowering the cost that's a, a little bit more creative ties into Melissa's uh, talk with astaxanthin is this um, supplement and antioxidant that people will pay a lot more than uh, what you would pay for gas. And we're not gonna pay less than what, you know, we could get at the, the gas station. But if you're growing up something that produces a high value commercial product like astaxanthin or other antioxidants, you can, kind of sell the production, the overall production cost has lowered because you're producing high value with low value and that can drive the cost down. So that's one option. Got it. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, Melissa, any thoughts? Right, so that's exactly why you wanna pair a high value product like astaxanthin is um, over $1,000 a kilogram, right? So once you throw that in, it all of a sudden becomes economically feasible. Right. So now if we can pair that, and we actually do have um, an astaxanthin market, right? It's already out. Um, some countries, the large portion of the population are taking astaxanthin supplements. I'm not sure what it is in our country, but in Asian countries, it's, you know, more than half the population are taking those huh. supplements. And now if you, um, and then of course, with now the pharmaceutical interest and, and that's really recent. Um, and once, you know, if you, if it's helpful in, you know, in a cancer situation or in a neurodegenerative diseases, right, those become much more, uh, you know, will it, people are willing to, to pay the money and then the production costs um, are still high, but the, the product is, you know, expensive, so it can match. 
Got it. That's, Thanks. That's why if we compare that and then we can get the whole like production pipeline going, then we can kind of move forward more with biofuel. So we've got a bit of a technical question related to the scale up process, um, which you've both talked about. So the question is, are there any difficulties with diffusing an adequate amount of light into the photobioreactors for scale up process? Yeah, to my knowledge, there's um, definitely only so much light can diffuse um, across beyond the surface. And so as you go lower and lower, there's this what they call a shading effect where algae at the top shades out the algae further down from the surface. So they're not gonna be able to grow and produce as more. So you're gonna reach some sort of um, plateau in terms of how much you can, can get out of it. And so in terms of trying to um, get around that problem in terms of scaling up and sort of the self-shading problem, uh, there's a lot of interest in how do you engineer the ponds to prevent that? How do you um, change or engineer the flow to make it so that there's sort of like a turnover maybe of some algae, as well as in these photobioreactors, they come in a variety of different shapes and sizes. So how do you increase the surface area that's exposed to light? So you can sometimes see these like kind of planes of photobioreactors rather than um, more typical cylindrical tubes. So I think that the this is um, definitely an engineering problem that people have many different solutions and ideas for. Got it. Um, so speaking of, of the engineering side of things, we got a, a broader question. Um, you know, when you're growing algae, do you use both fresh water and salt water in your research? And if the answer is yes about salt water, are there any difficulties with increasing salinity in the raceway ponds as the algae grows? I can take that question as well. So um, yes, we do look at both fresh water and, and salt water. Um, in fact, a lot of the screens that they do in terms of picking out which are good strains, they look for, um, they, they test out different salinity levels, including uh, very high levels of salinity, even levels that are equivalent to ocean water. This uh, alga that we found at this brewery, in fact, is considered um, very halo tolerant, as they call it. So that means it has a high salt tolerance and it has been grown in, in levels of salinity up to um, like seawater equivalents. But I will say not all algae can grow at salt water. A lot of these that are identified as um, top strains of interest are freshwater strains and this can limit um, their utility if we were to want to use a saltier water source. Great, thank you, Sarah. We actually have two questions um, and I'll read them both because they're similar. Um, just so you know, there are two folks who are asking this. Um, how do we prevent a genetically modified alga from escaping into the wild and causing environmental problems? And the second, similarly, how do you address concerns about growing genetically engineered, engineered algae in open air ponds? So both of those as threats to genetically modified organisms, essentially. Yeah, that is definitely a legitimate concern. Um, if I think that people, when sometimes when they hear my talk and they're like, you're trying to engineer algae that grow even better. Um, what if they get out and basically become toxic algal blooms, like what you had mm -hmm. at the beginning of your talk? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's like they could be a weed, like similar to weeds that we see in non-native um, kind of uh, spread. And in terms of how do we prevent this, I think beyond just being careful in controlled environments, there are regulations that are in place to prevent people from just engineering whatever they want with any, without any sort of um, uh, way to prevent it from getting out. So you do go through a regulata regulatory process to get approved by the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, and they will review your study before they will let you deploy it out in, in you're not actually deploying it out in nature, but out outdoors um, so that it doesn't accidentally get contaminated. As well as uh, you can imagine, other ways of preventing um, your genetically modified organism from kind of 
getting out of control is to engineer maybe a gene in that makes it required to be grown in a certain state or condition required to grow if you add a nutrient. And then if it lacks that nutrient, it's not gonna be able to kind of explode out of control in numbers. Yeah, definitely. And on the flip side, um, there was a question and now I, of course, in open uh, raceway ponds, how do you protect against contamination the other way, right? So contamination from getting in. Yeah, I'm, I'm not too knowledgeable at on this, but Melissa can also take a shot. I'll just say my guess is that um, contamination does occur. Um, and one way to maybe prevent it is um, any sort of like a um, kind of engineering solutions by maybe covering it with some uh, kind of getting air and things in. Um, I, I, I imagine physical covers or maybe wind uh, could also be used. But um, another thing to consider is we, we do look at whether um, algae are particularly tolerant in bacterial communities, as well as in some cases, the bacteria, what are considered bacteria contaminants could actually help the growth as well um, and not necessarily hurt it. So there are, um, there are examples of that. And Melissa, did you want to chime in before we go to the next question? Uh, I could just add, right, so if you have more like the salt water or wastewater, right, type environments, then they're less conducive to, you know, a lot of freshwater algae or yeah. what you have out there. And, and I think as long as, as long as you don't have a, a dampening on the growth of the organism you are interested in, then it's potentially workable solution. And then of course, as Sarah mentioned previously, right, there are sort of more the closed systems of, um, you know, the, the sort of little, more like the bags or those kinds of ways to grow algae that are not exposed, which also might be relevant for the genetic engineering type considerations as well. Thanks. So, so we got a couple of specific questions for each of your presentations. Um, Melissa, I'm going to start with this question for you. Uh, somebody asked, is it common for organisms to have such a wide range in chromosome size? Uh, they, they observed that um, the smallest chromosome had less than half as many DNA bases as the largest one. I think you had in one of your sequencing slides of, uh, of algae. Yeah, that's a very, uh, very specific. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it is pretty common to have such a wide variety in, in chromosome sizes. Um, there's definitely some organisms that have more uh, comparable uh, sizes, but I mean, you can even think about like in the human genome, like even the X plus Y are quite different. So I think uh, chromosome um, sizes is, yeah, very common or variable amounts of chromosome sizes and length is very common. Got it, thank you. Um, and then a question for Sarah. Um, given that the algae in question you, you mentioned that was isolated at New Belgium Brewery, um, does the brewery have any proprietary interest in any improvements? Are they collaborating with the JGI and with you on, on this discovery? So they are definitely not collaborating with us, but we are open to collaboration. <laughs> um, to my knowledge, they don't have a proprietary interest. They were using the alga in a totally different uh, way than, than we use it. And um, in fact, so I don't know if you're familiar with the brewing process, but it was in the clarifier uh, water. So it, it helps kind of the visual of your beer to make it really like crisp and clear looking. And it kind of like helps to kind of like aggregate all the like gook in a normal like hazy beer. And so I think because their interests are so different, um, I, I don't think that they have sort of a, a proprietary interest to prevent us from using this. This was collected through a national bioprospecting project. Got it. Um, you know, so, you know, as we talk about this collaboration with New Belgium, uh, we got another question in from one of our uh, listeners. So do you think the future of commercial algae cultivation lies in biofuels or do you think it's more towards specialty chemical production. You know, you talked a little bit about, you know, the, the various applications for, for algae in, in food, in, in cosmetics, things like that. What, what do you both think the, the future of commercial algae cultivation lies? Where do you think it lies? 
I think it lies in both. I mean, I think in terms of the large amount and volume and biomass, um, that's going to be for fuel and for bioenergy. But then you'll obviously have these products um, that are of higher value that don't need to be as large of scale, but on a financial level, they may be, you know, comparable in terms of what they're um, bringing in. So I, I think that there, there's a future for algae in, in both directions um, that will be important. Mm -hmm. I would agree. I think that we're so early in the development of this and that there's so much potential in algal biofuels um, that I definitely wouldn't count biofuels out yet. And there's definitely a ton of specialized molecules. We probably don't even know the extent of the diversity of molecules that algae can produce or be engineered to produce. Great. Could you, either of you give maybe besides the antioxidants, what's another byproduct that would be interesting to folks watching? Or is, are there any, is this antioxidant one kind of the big one right now? Well, so they, so because right, algae uh, deal with high light and light a lot, there are a lot that are related to light mm -hmm. um, with antioxidants. So there's like sunscreen properties, right? Mm -hmm. So they actually, right, use astaxanthin in cosmetics or in um, like, where you could use it in sunscreens or those kinds mm -hmm. of things that can be called a sunscreen molecule. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, right, there's, I mean, beta carotene is, and vitamin oh, E, like all of those are all from um, or can be synthesized by algae. Um, yeah, there's, I think there's a whole host. And I mean, one area that I think would be really interesting or has a lot of potential for growth would be in like bioplastics, right? In that direction, I think has a lot of different applications that could be used. And I think algae could be utilized in that way to make a, you know, plastic type substance that would be more sustainable. Cool. Sarah, do you want to add to that? Uh, no, I, I mean, I agree with um, mm -hmm. everything Melissa just said. I guess it kind of goes a further away from your question in terms of like an interesting molecule. But I, I just wanted to add, there's another use of algal oil and that is cooking oil as well. And so you can actually see in some Whole Foods or Safeways, they actually sell algal derived oil too. And that's another use for that. Right, and of course there's like spirulina and all of those that people are taking in health and nutraceuticals. Um, I mean, and then there's of course like carrageenan and all of that, which is in your toothpaste and all kinds of other products. I mean, there's products from algae all, all throughout your house. And of course then there's seaweed and porphyra is the type of seaweed there that we eat as nori or in cooking. Um, I mean, yeah, they're, they're all over your house if, if you look for it or products from <laughs> algae all are, are all over your house and you're using them daily and yeah. Who knew beer? I mean, right there. <laughs> um, so before we end, I just want to ask you all, because we did have a question about how undergrads might be able to join one of your labs or get involved. And I just really wanted to use that as sort of a jumping off point. What did you guys even study as undergrads? Because it's not like you're studying algae, right? So I'm curious what backgrounds you all have. Sure. I have a background um, in, in biology. I was an undergraduate in ocean sciences at Stanford University. Um, I actually did take an algal class or a marine <laughs> botany class. Um, and we do have undergrads in our group. Um, usually they're a large component during this current COVID uh, situation. Mm -hmm. We've had to really, um, we haven't had undergrads come back to the lab. We have a lot of bioinformatic um, projects that the undergrads are working on now, but we do yeah, have undergrads in our lab frequently. We even have high school students at times. Um, we have a lot of different training opportunities for people at all, all ages. Um, and, but yeah, my guess, my background was in, in biology and marine biology. Um, Ocean science. Great. So would it be appropriate if people just contact you directly? Um, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <of laughs> yeah. Contact us. Um, it sounds like somebody has an undergrad in mind. That's <laughs> yeah, we, we welcome, um, and I'm also connected to other people that also are looking for undergrads. But undergrads play a large uh, role in um, in our research, and as well mm -hmm. as trying to train sort of 
young people in the way of science. Hopefully, I mean, some do, you know, continue on to graduate school and then some go into medical or other things, but we think sort of the scientific training in that you learn, there's a lot of skills that are useful um, in science and beyond. So we do think that, you know, education is an important component as well. Thanks, Melissa. What about you, Sarah? Where are you, what's your background? Yeah, so when I was in undergrad, I definitely didn't take an algal biology course. I was studying uh, engineering, actually bioengineering, and I was um, doing my research in a computational biology lab. And I think in terms of computational biology, it is so applicable to so many different fields that it's, it's actually really fun to kind of jump around from project to project. And I really rely closely on my collaborators because I don't spend much time actually in the lab or on, on like these field sites where they're collecting the samples, they're doing the experiments. But I think computational biology is um, one cool way of getting into science, particularly right now in COVID when a lot of labs aren't taking undergrads um, into the lab space just because of um, scaling back in terms of people. Yeah. And I would say that in terms of an undergrad being interested, the JGI does have some formal internship programs for undergrads to, to participate, as well as just reaching out to um, people they know at JGI. You, they can feel free to email me, and I can put them in touch with people who are um, interested in taking on undergrads in their, in their lab. And... Um, yeah, I think that there's just a growing number of resources also for learning algal biology online as well. There's more courses, there's like a Coursera course and so many resources out there. So it sounds like there's lots of entryways, there's lots of pathways once you enter, how to enter this field and from computers to field campaigns, it sounds like if you're interested in, in any of those things, you, there's a way in, right? And we have two amazing role models right here. So thank you both for joining us. Um, Jen, I, Berkeley Labs, UC Berkeley, thank you so much, both of you. Thank you everyone who's joined, who's add, added some questions to the Q&A. As Jen mentioned, we will be back next year. So stay tuned. Um, everyone have a, a happy Thanksgiving, happy holidays, and we'll see you back soon. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Great Thank conversation. You. Thank you.